Bibles with you this morning, I want to ask you to open them up to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> our hearts, there are two potentially major struggles taking place. One is a deep longing, a driving need for acceptance. We long, we hunger for knowing that we are approved. Two is an equally deep and driving fear of rejection. When we feel that others accept us, it affirms our sense of significance and value. But when we believe or feel that people reject us, it leaves us feeling insignificant and lonely. One prominent figure said that the deep need of man is the need to overcome separateness, to leave the prison of his aloneness. I don't think it is too much to say that these two twin battles are the root cause of many of our problems, that we'll do just about anything if we believe it will gain the love and the approval of others and protect us from rejection. Many of us in our own lives, in our quest, our hunger for acceptance and the approval of others have already fallen into drugs or alcohol, gangs, religious cults, crime, sexual promiscuity, anything that we believe will somehow secure the acceptance of others and protect us from rejection. And when we find ourselves in that place of this unsatisfied hunger, we discover that we're on a treadmill that we can never get off. And we make two discoveries along the way. One is we soon learn that the approval of others always has a limited shelf life. It doesn't last very long. It's conditional. It is temporary. Second, we also learn that the approval of others never fully satisfies. <coughs> it never satiates our hearts, if you will, to a degree that we go, I know, and I am secure, and I am content, that I know that I'm unconditionally loved and unconditionally accepted. The Bible says that they will never know that unconditional love or acceptance until we come to know personally God's Son, Jesus Christ. It was the great theologian Augustine in the third century who wrote in his book Confessions. He said, you, God, have made us for yourself and our hearts find no peace until they find rest in you. Amen. Amen. I don't know where you're at this morning. But you will never find that security in your heart, that longing to know that you're unconditionally accepted and loved until you come to Christ. Amen to that. The Bible says that God knows us better than we know ourselves. David said this, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me. God knows your deepest needs. He knows your greatest fears. You know what I find interesting about many believers today? And the reason I say this is because I've discovered my own life. Is that there are times in life where I've said, God, let me know your peace. God, let me know your unconditional acceptance. God, let me know your love that is unconditional. And I realized all I had to do was read his word. And I find that he's already answered my prayer. The Apostle Paul said this, Therefore, since we have been made right with God in, by, made right with God in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. Amen. He's saying this, that the moment you cross that line of faith and you place your trust in Jesus Christ, that you have God's unconditional love and acceptance, that you have peace with God. You do not need to ask for what you already have. And yet there are many believers who are struggling in their daily walk with God because they don't know God's unconditional love and acceptance. 
They're still struggling with the wavering emotions of doubt and suspicion. Do you know why? Because somewhere along in your life, maybe you had someone who promised you their unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, somebody you thought you should get that love from, your parent or a spouse or someone that was significant in your life, and your heart was broken. And now you're wondering, God, are you going to let me down too? And we hunger, we long for that secure knowledge, that foundation that can never change or shift, that we have that unconditional love and acceptance. And God says, listen, you already have it in me. Stop wavering, stop wondering, stop doubting. You have it in me. Do you know my prayer is for you this morning? For each one of us is that we would have the very level of conviction that the Apostle Paul had when he looked at Christ's love for him and he said, nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. When he said, I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted him until that day. My prayer for you this morning as you come here to worship the Lord and as you embrace Christ in faith that you know that love that Christ has for you that it satisfies that hunger, that deep need for unconditional love, unconditional acceptance that can only be found in Him. You see, believer, if you have crossed that line of faith, if you're a believer this morning, you have that love. You have that peace. You're just not walking in faith to embrace it. And you're allowing circumstances, painful experiences of the past, your own heart of doubt to cause you to live in turmoil. And God says you don't need to live that way anymore. I want you to know the security of my love and acceptance. Well, if you have your Bibles, open to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the great chapter that is called the Great Hall of Faith. The late, late, uh, the late Ray Sedman called this chapter the Parade of the Heroes of Faith. And in these 40 verses, we're going to look at 17 individuals and more that are heroes of faith that are going to show us that by faith they got off of that treadmill of longing for the acceptance of and the love, the approval, the world could never give them. And there are two words that are uttered all the way through this chapter more than 20 times that show us the secret of getting off that treadmill, the secret of breaking free from the addiction of approval. By faith. By faith. By faith. He says again and again. You see, the basis of our forgiveness, our acceptance, our approval... Our salvation in Christ has been and always will be by faith in Christ. Amen. It has always been that way. It will always be that way. So if you have your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 11 this morning, I was uh, a bit ambitious when I first tackled this passage, thinking somehow I could cover three verses. <laughs> and I realized after I was walking through these verses that we're only going to get through verse 4. Five and six will come later. But I want you to hear the very first man of faith that is ever recorded, not only in world history, but recorded in Scripture. And his name is Abel, a name that many of us are familiar with. Chapter 11, verse 4, By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts through faith. Though he is dead, he still speaks. This is an amazing verse. And in this verse, packed in this verse, are three core essentials, three truths about a faith that pleases God. And I want to look at each of these three as we kind of unpack this verse this morning. The first one is this, that a faith that pleases God is one that comes from a heart that is a love that seeks to do God's will according to His Word. Let me say that again because you need to hear that. It's a love, a heart that seeks to do God's will according to His Word. 
Faith that pleases God is one that says, God, I want to know what your will is according to your word, and that's what I'm going to do. The Bible says so by faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And that's exactly what Abel shows us. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain. See, Cain and Abel were the second and third men to ever walk the face of the earth. They were the first brothers. And they were the first ones that ever had to know what it means to walk by faith. You say, well, wait now. Where's that and Eve? Weren't they the first ones? Yes, but they didn't have to walk by faith. You say, what does that mean? According to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. They didn't need faith. It wasn't until they were kicked out of the garden and they sinned, then they needed faith. But you see, Cain and Abel had never seen God. And so they were the first ones to learn what it means to walk and to live by faith. And their account is reported for us in 10 verses in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And there's something very significant that we see. It says that Cain offered, pardon me, Abel offered to God an acceptable sacrifice, and Cain's was not. What we learn in those verses is something very significant. Is that God clearly has shown Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, that there is a place, and there is a time, and there is a way that they were to present an acceptable offering or an act of worship to God. You say, well, how, how do you know that from what Genesis says? Because God had shown Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that one day God would send a sin-suffering Savior, a sin-conquering Savior who would die for the atonement of their sins. And so through that, God began the process of making an offering that is an act of worship that looked forward to that ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God who would die on the cross for the sins of the world. So God had divinely ordained a place, a time, and a way that Cain and Abel clearly knew that, it was a, that they could approach God through faith as a way God wanted them to approach Him. One of the ways we know this is the fact that Cain and Abel were almost 100 plus years old at this time. So they've been doing this for a long time. They knew exactly how to approach God. They had learned exactly from their parents what God wanted in an acceptable offering. But the Bible says something interesting. It says that Cain was a tiller of the soil and Abel was a keeper of the flocks. So when they brought their offerings to God, naturally Cain brought something from his produce. Last service, somebody told me they knew what it was. It was broccoli. <laughs> and I had to agree with him. But Cain brought produce, and Abel brought, it says, the best of his lambs. He brought God his blue ribbon lambs. Now, what's significant is not so much that they brought different items. What the author of Hebrews is picking up, and what Genesis picks up, is that they offered it in different, with different hearts. <clears throat> Abel's heart was one of faith. Cain's heart was not. And so Cain's sacrifice was rejected by God. Abel's sacrifice was accepted because it was offered in accordance to God's word. And he brought this blue ribbon lamb, actually more than one, one commentator put Abel's sacrifice in prophetic perspective when he said this. He said, in Abel's sacrifice, the way of the cross was prefigured. The first sacrifice was Abel's lamb. Listen, one lamb for one person. Later came Passover with one lamb for one family. Then came the Day of Atonement with one lamb for one nation. And finally came Good Friday with one lamb for the entire world. Amen. When John the Baptist saw Jesus and he recognized who he was for the first time, he says in John chapter 1, verse 29, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. He recognized what Abel recognized for thousands of years, every person who's walked in faith, that God one day would send a sacrificial lamb who would be the sin bearer for all sins of the world. And John recognized that through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus is that Lamb who is our sin-conquering, sin-bearing Savior. Amen. And Abel, as he made that sacrifice, that offering of his blue ribbon lambs, was looking ahead thousands and thousands and thousands of years later at the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. You see, the only way we can ever approach God is by faith through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. The only way to approach Him. You see, both Cain and Abel brought offerings. But Cain's offering was rejected. It was not done in faith. Abel's was. Both of them clearly knew God's will. They clearly knew what God expected. But Cain, like his parents, decided to do his own thing. Cain was the first Saint Frank, uh, Frank Sinatra who decided he was going to do it his own way. He had no desire to follow God's word or to please him. And what that really revealed is this. Listen carefully. What you see going on here is this, is that Cain had no awareness of his own personal brokenness, his fallenness before a holy God. He had no need, recognized need of his own salvation. He did not see his sin for what it really was. And so he's the very execution. What is true faith? But there's something else about false religions. They never fully satisfy. You can be in a cult all your life, be as faithful as you want to be, but you'll never be satisfied until you come to Christ through the shed blood of his through his shed blood on the cross. I came across something the other day I thought it was interesting. See, you have two brothers. They're the second and third men that have walked the earth, and they're really the first in many ways. They're the first brothers. Uh, they're the first to want to demonstrate faith. One is the first to murder somebody, but they're also the, the first ones to demonstrate sibling rivalry. And the little boy wrote this note in all sincerity. He said, maybe Cain and Abel would not have killed each other if they'd had their own rooms. <laughs> That's what my mom did for me and my brother. <laughs> Well, Cain didn't kill Abel, and Abel didn't kill Cain. Cain murdered Abel. And you see, false religion cannot tolerate true faith. It will ultimately manifest its true nature and try to silence or persecute or remove true faith. So Cain was the first one to start false religion, that is, man's own approach to God. Years ago, when I was at Baltimore Seminary, or pardon me, uh, Baltimore University, I asked a gentleman who was teaching a course who had been entrenched in a cult for many, many years. He's now a believer and he was a professor. And I asked him, I said, I said, you, you talked about being in the cult for, for many years and now you're a believer, but tell me what kept you in that cult for so long? What, what left you feeling satisfied that you stayed there? I'll never forget his answer. He said, John, he said, being in that cult was like eating sawdust. It left you feeling full, but it never satisfied you. It never satisfied you. You see, until you come to Christ, until you approach Him in faith through His finished work on the cross, you'll never know what it means to be truly satisfied. The difference between true faith and false religion is that true faith in Christ is going to leave you satisfied. False faith never will. So first of all, the way we please God is we have to come to Him with a heart that says, God, I want to know Your will, and I want to do Your will according to Your Word. Second is this, it is a life that gains God's acceptance. Now I want you to notice there's actually a progression of, of logic here. First of all, I come to God through faith. I believe in the finished work of Christ on the cross. The moment I do that, like Abel, we're declared righteous. But second... That declaration of God's acceptance or righteousness is the result of my faith in Christ. I'm not righteous, therefore God accepts me, but rather I, accept, I put faith in Christ and then I'm declared righteous. So verse 4 says this, though through, uh, that is, Abel offered a better sacrifice through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. So the moment he acted in faith, God accepted his offering and declared him as righteous. 
Now, nobody really knows how Abel knew that he was righteous. How did God speak to Abel and say, Abel, that is great. You got it. I'm going to accept that sacrifice. Nobody really knows. Jewish tradition says it was fire, that God sent down fire as an indelible sign to confirm to Abel that he had indeed accepted his sacrifice. The Bible doesn't say it. But God certainly has done that at least five other times throughout the Old Testament to confirm his acceptance of that sacrifice. But the point the Hebrews wants to make for us is this, is that by Abel's act of obedient faith, God saw him as righteous. In other words, Abel had God's acceptance and approval by his act of faith. Now this is very important for us to understand. It's not that Abel came to God because he was already righteous. And it's not that when Abel came to God and offered his, his sacrifice that somehow he suddenly became perfect and arrived. No, he was still the same sinner when he left that offering as when he came to it. He went home that day with the same kinds of problems as he went to that offering with. But something took place inside of his life that began to transform him. The very power of God through his faith. So much so that Jesus tells us in Matthew 23, 35, that Abel is called the righteous Abel. That his reputation of his character began to manifest the very righteous belief that God had in his acceptance of him. John, the apostle, says of, of Abel that he is a righteous man by his actions. Abel had a well-known reputation of being a man whose faith produced a life that was marked by righteousness. And this is important. It doesn't mean that he arrived. He was still a sinner. He still messed up. But what's different is this, is that Abel now realized through God's indelible sign that he had God's unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. And that was through his faith. And when you know that you have God's unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, everything about you begins to change, doesn't it? I'll never forget the day that that began to dawn in my own awareness. That I could read God's Word, but until I put glasses of faith on to really see what God's Word says, and really take it for what it says, that despite my feelings, despite, despite my doubts, despite my failed experiences of the past, when I trust God's Word, and He says to me, listen, by your faith in my shed Son's blood on the cross, I now love you with an eternal love, accept you with an eternal acceptance. When I began to really embrace that, my life began to radically change. Mm -hmm. How many of you struggled this morning? Maybe there are past failures in your life. Maybe there are not so distant past failures. You woke up this morning and there they were looking at you in the mirror. And you honestly wonder how could God possibly love me? I was reading Second Chronicles the other day. David wants to build a house for God. Nathan the prophet comes back and says, God says, no, you're not going to build a house. Instead, God is going to build an eternal dynasty for you. Mm -hmm. And David is so overwhelmed by this lofty, incredible promise of God. The first thing he says, he says, God, you know who I am. You know who I am. We don't deserve God's eternal, unconditional love and acceptance. There's nothing in your past, nothing in your present, nothing in your future that says you're going to merit this acceptance by God. You'll never be good enough. It is only by your faith in Christ that God says, I accept you as my forever child. I love you with an eternal love. I know you. I know where you've been. I know who you are. But one truth that is greater than all of that, I love you with an unconditional love. Amen. 
And when you begin to embrace that and take God at His word, it begins to radically change your life from the inside out. It was the great missionary Hudson Taylor who said it so well. I find myself repeating him over the years because he said it so well. That a life that is marked by faith is going to be marked by God's acceptance. And that's going to have an inward transformation. Hudson Taylor said this, If your father and mother and your sister or brother, if the very cat and dog in your house are not happier for you being a Christian, it is a question whether you really are. <laughs> So I have to ask you, how's your cat? How's your dog? Or how is your wife? How's your husband? Do they see that inward change of Christ at work in your life? You see, God gave Abel a sign, an indelible sign that said, you have my acceptance, my approval. But let me ask you this question. You as a believer this morning, sitting where you are, what is that indelible sign that God has given you, that sure and eternal and changing sign that God says, I love you? What was it? The cross. It was the cross. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. He goes on to say, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We have all fallen short through Christ, uh, through short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. Couldn't be any clearer, could it? Just like Abel, God has given us a clear and indelible sign of his acceptance, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And when we place our faith in Christ and obedience to his word, God changes our lives. And the remarkable thing is this. It's not that God says, okay, now I love you, and now I want you to kind of struggle and work it all out from here on out by yourself. That's not the case. Scripture says, in fact, the moment we cross that threshold of faith and we place our trust in Christ, God begins to work powerfully through His grace. That is what grace is, by the way, the power to change. Through His grace, He begins to work on the inside of us, changing us, transforming us to be like His Son. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, For God is at work in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what He pleases. He's at work inside of you, giving you the desire and the power. That's grace at work in your life. Isn't that true? When you become a believer, things begin to change in the inside of your life. You go, wow, where'd this come from? That's not me. That's God working by His grace inside of you, the power to change. And you become that person who lives in accordance with the security and the knowledge that I have God's unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. Let me just pause here for a moment and kind of step out of this for a moment. What do you do? What do you do if you're a believer and you sin horribly, tragically in your life? What do you do? Hit your knees. What do you do? What do we normally do? That's a better question. Normally we run from God in shame. We hide from our own guilt. We suppress it. We deny it. We do all kinds of things. Why? Because we're so fresh in that sense of guilt and the torment of what we've done. We feel unforgivable ashamed of what we've done. And rightly so. But what should we do? The Bible says the moment you mess up, the moment you sin, don't let there be any gap of time between that and coming before God's throne of grace and saying, God, I messed up, I blew it. Let me tell you, that's one of the hardest things to do. Because you feel so undeserving as you come before His throne of grace. And God, you know what I've done. I have no business being before your throne of grace. Why am I here? I am guilty of sin. 
You step forward and you approach God by faith. Mm -hmm. The Bible says if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Listen, believer, if you're here this morning and you mess up in your life and you feel so horribly ashamed of your sin, don't let time go by. Deal with that sin right now. Come before God's throne of grace and deal with it. Confess it to Him what you've done. Ask Him to forgive you. And He says, I will forgive you. And then He starts the healing process. But as long as you wait, you're going to be in a place of torment. So we live a life that gains God's acceptance because we know we've placed our faith in Him. One person said that obedient faith and living right, faith and works, are like wings of a bird. There can be no real life that is no flight without, without, with a single wing, whether works or faith. But when the two are in concert, he says, the owner soars through the heavens. Authentic faith always produces authentic living. So the second step to kicking this approval addiction in our lives is knowing that we have God's acceptance through His Son, Jesus Christ. But there's a third one, and that is this. The verse goes on to say, And through faith, though He is dead, he'll, He still speaks. And through faith, though He is dead, He still speaks. He's saying something powerful. He's saying that Abel has left a legacy that has won God's eternal honor. <clears throat> and that's what happens for you and for me. When we are faithful, we leave a legacy in which God honors of faith. He's saying that even though Abel is dead, you cannot silence a living faith. Can I ask you a question this morning? What is the legacy of faith that you're going to leave behind? What if today were the last day that God marked on His calendar of your life? What would be the legacy of your faith? That you'd leave for your children, your grandchildren, your family, your friends? Would it be an able-like faith that though you're dead, your faith lives on? That's what he's saying here, that a faith that does God's will according to His Word, gains God's acceptance. And in that acceptance, God will leave a legacy of faith that honors Him. Even though you're dead, your faith will continue to live on in the lives of others. One of my favorite heroes of the 2nd or probably 12th or 13th centuries is St. Francis of Assisi. He was a remarkable man in that he... He went against the grain, if you will, of the so-called religious authorities of his day. He was a devout follower of Christ. I remember when I was in Italy years ago, I went to a, a place where he had ministered, and there uh, enshrined, or I should say enclosed, was a, a, a case that had his robe still inside there. He was a remarkable man of faith. And one day, as the story goes, he called one of his young monks, and he said, hey, he said, let's go down to the town and preach. The novice, of course, was delighted at being singled out by such a great follower of Christ to go preach. He quickly obeyed. And off they went. They passed through the major streets. And then they turned down a number of side streets and alleys. And they made their way through the suburbs. And finally, they made their way back up to the very gate of the monastery where they had started from. And as they approached the gate... The young man reminded Francis of their original intention. He said, but you've forgotten, Father, that we went down to the town to preach. To which a sissy replied, my son, we have preached. We went down to the town to preach. We were preaching while we were walking. We have been seen by many. Our behavior has been closely watched. It was thus we preached our morning sermon. It is of no use, my son, to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. The same can be said of Abel. You can read from Genesis to Revelation. And nowhere in all of those books will you ever find one word uttered by Abel. And yet his faith lives on. 
He powerfully and eloquently speaks thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, though he has not said a word. What is your legacy of faith going to be like? Have people seen you preach, not heard you preach, but seen you preach? The faith that pleases God is a faith of a sincere love that desires to do His will according to His word first and foremost. It doesn't matter how sincere you are, but unless you follow God's word according to what He has written, your faith is useless. And when you follow His word with a faith that desires to please God according to His will, He says, you have my acceptance. You can place your full confidence of faith in me. When we've done that, we leave a legacy that wins God's eternal honor. Do you know what I think heaven is going to be like in many ways? Heaven is going to be us enjoying God's eternal favor, His eternal honor, saying, well done, well done, my faithful servant. I think heaven is going to be a time in which our Heavenly Father will continue to bathe us, if you will, in the joy of knowing we're His children. Isn't that true for you today and your own children, your own grandchildren? You want them to know that I love you. I love you just the way you are. And I want you to know that I love you unconditionally. I accept you unconditionally. And when you give that love to your children, you're showing them the very love that Christ has for you through His shed blood on the cross. Will you pray with me? This morning I want to do two things as we pray. You may be here today but you've never crossed that line of faith before. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. Oh, you believe in Jesus. You know about Jesus. But you've never personally accepted His invitation for the work that He did on the cross for you as your sin conqueror. I want to invite you to do that this morning. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're a believer and you've been a believer for a long time. But if you look back at your life, it's been one of wavering, uncertainty, troubled, filled with doubt because you're unsure of God's acceptance. You're unsure of God's forgiveness. You're unsure of His love. Today, will you pray that God would give you the eyes of faith, the level of conviction that the Apostle Paul said there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ? I know whom I have believed and am confident that I have entrusted to Him. What I have entrusted in me will keep until the, that day. <clears throat> if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never trusted Him as your personal Savior, would you do that right now through this prayer? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I believe, Lord, that you died on the cross as my sin bearer. That you conquered my sins through your shed blood. And I ask you, Lord, for your forgiveness. I ask you to come into my life and show me, Lord, what it means to experience and to know your unconditional love and acceptance. Lord, I ask, would you free me from this endless treadmill of approval? And let my heart soar with security and my soul be established in the certainty of the promises of your word that I am loved, I am accepted, I am approved because of my faith in Christ. If you're here this morning and maybe you've been a believer for years, but your life has been marked by 
potholes of doubt, speed bumps of uncertainty. And you find yourself wondering, how could God love me? What have I done? Look at my past. Look at who I am. Believer, would you look to Jesus? Stop looking back. Stop looking around. And put your eyes on Jesus. And by faith, would you step toward the cross and say, Lord Jesus, here I am. You died for me. Help me to put my full weight of trust in you. Thank you for your unconditional love and acceptance. May my heart ever grow stronger in that life-changing truth. Thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your strong name. In a moment, we're going to take communion, and as we do, I want to remind you of Matthew chapter 26. It says that in the final evening, Jesus was with his disciples, and he ate that final dinner that we are all so familiar with. As they were eating, Jesus took some of the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. In a moment, you're going to have a, a wafer in your hand. And that wafer looks back on the sacrifice that Christ made for you. But there was a time way back in history that Abel made that sacrifice. And that sacrifice looked forward to what that wafer means. That Christ died for you. And you're going to take the cup, in which it says that he took the cup of wine and he gave it, gave thanks to God for it, and he gave it to them and he said, take each of you and drink from it, for this is my blood, which, is, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. When you take that cup, it's going to remind you of that shed blood that looks back 2,000 years ago that Christ paid for you on the cross. And everything you're about to do is an act of faith as much as Abel's was in offering the sacrifice. And what God is looking for is not simply going through the mechanical motions of taking communion. What God is looking for is a heart that says, God, I realize what you've done for me. Thank you. I accept it. Will the ushers come forward this morning to share communion? Thank mm -hmm. you.
confess that you are the King of our hearts and the Lord of our lives. you hold in your hand <clears throat> looks back 2,000 years ago at the finished work of your Savior on the cross for you. Jesus said, take eat, this is my body. After they were finished eating, it says he took the cup. This is the blood of or represents the blood of Christ that he shed for you on the cross. Years ago when I was in Italy, or pardon me, Jerusalem, I went to what is Calvary, and I broke away from the group. I walked up to the top of Calvary where there were three holes in the ground where the crosses would have hung. I got on my hands and knees and I reached my arm down in that center hole where the shed blood of Christ would have poured. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you so that you would know his unconditional love, unconditional acceptance. He said, take drink. 
This is the cup of the covenant for the forgiveness of the sins of many. Last week, Pastor John talked about God paying a debt that he didn't owe. And that reminded me of an old song that we have resurrected. And we'd love to have you stand up and sing it with us. He paid a debt that he did not owe. And on one of the verses, it talks about dross. And uh, some of the girls here weren't sure what dross was. Dross is the impurities that come to the surface when the fires of, of uh, silversmiths and uh, molten liquid get really hot. And, when, and the silversmith knows that, that it's ready when he has scoop, scooped off the dross, the impurities, and he can see his reflection in um, the molten liquid. And my prayer for myself and for all of you is that in the fiery trials of our life, that the dross would come to the surface and we would allow God to skim it off so that he would see his reflection in us and that others would see his reflection. chicken, by the way, too. Today's the last day to sign up. I don't know if you said that, Bill, or not. I didn't say that on Sunday. Yeah, so it's good that you said that. Um, but, uh, so today's the last day to sign up for our Valentine's Day. It's going to be a lot of fun. And as well, on that morning, that is Saturday morning, we have our men's breakfast. Colin is going to be wrapping up on a young earth, on the scientific part of that. He talked about the theological part of that last time. So he'll recap a little bit on that and give us the science part of that. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, ladies, by the way, if you want to be a part of this, uh, I'm just going to just going to take a step out of faith here. The guys won't be too mad at me. But you're welcome to be a part of that, too. I think you'll thoroughly enjoy it. So um, that'll be breakfast on Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. And then you're welcome to come here and, 
hear Colin talk about it. One other thing I just share with you about Colin is he's teaching a hermeneutics course. I know that doesn't make any sense. He's teaching a course on how do you understand the Bible when you read it. That's on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. So he'll be doing another uh, session this next sap Sunday as well. So I remind you of those great, important opportunities that we have. So go, walk strong in the grace of God, be a blessing to those around you. Have a great day. Amen.